Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. What we would like to do tonight, we spent uh, three or four days here talking about the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, <clears throat> talking about the thing we call the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, talking about it in the application of our lives on a personal basis so that we could recover from this hopeless condition of the mind and of the body called alcoholism. But we know that AA is made up of a lot more than just the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. We know we also have a thing called the traditions. We know that we also have a thing called the service structure. And we know those traditions and that service structure, the same as the 12 steps, were left to us as legacies from the first people in Alcoholics Anonymous. A legacy being something that has been left to you by people who have gone on before you. We know that in AA we have a logo, which is a circle with a triangle inside the circle. And we don't think that that's there just by accident. The triangle being supposedly the strongest structure that you can possibly have. And Bill placed his triangle inside that circle, and there he put the three legacies of Alcoholics Anonymous. On the bottom of that triangle, we have the first legacy called Recovery. And we know that that legacy was given to us in 1939 in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12-step 12, the 12 program of recovery. We know that one side of that triangle... <laughs> is what we call unity. And as we dig into this a little deeper tonight, we will find that unity, <coughs> the 12 traditions, was given to us some years later by those first members of Alcoholics Anonymous. We know that the third side of the triangle is called service. He's getting, he's getting smarter now, isn't he? <laughs> and we know that that was given to us some years later by the original people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I don't think it's by accident that recovery is on the bottom. Because recovery supports the other two sides of the triangle. And I think one of the greatest mistakes that's being made in AA today is many of us are trying to practice unity without recovery first. And many of us are being involved in the service structure without recovery first. And it's almost impossible to practice unity and service without some humility. And humility seems to be gained through the program of recovery. It's almost impossible to have unity within an AA group unless we have recovery as the base of the group. And it's usually easy to tell which group has recovery and which doesn't because when you go into a group that has no recovery, you usually find them fighting with each other, raising hell with each other, <coughs> gossiping about each other, 
very, very critical of each other. And that's because there's no recovery at the basis of that group. And it's nearly impossible to practice unity without recovery first. It's very easy to go into one of our service areas and determine whether there's recovery there or not. Because it's hard to do good service work and practice the tolerance and patience needed for in service work unless you've got recovery at the base of it. So I don't think it's by accident that recovery is the basis. Now, some of the highlights of our AA history, we've already talked about them to a certain extent. and We'll kind of discuss them a little and as we go along tonight. We know that one of the beginning points of our whole fellowship was when Ebby visited with Bill and tells Bill his story in the latter part of November of 1934. And as we've already talked, Bill went into the town's hospital in the early part of December after withdrawal he applied the little practical program of action from the Oxford groups and had his spiritual experience in December of 1934. We know that from December through May, Bill did his best to work with other alcoholics in New York City, knowing that if he was to keep what he had, he would have to give it away. But as we saw before in Bill's story, he wasn't successful with any of them. Primarily because he talked to them about his great white flash that he had had in that hospital. He talked to them about the need for spiritual recovery. But he never did tell them what was wrong with them. And as we talked in Bill's story, one day while back in the town's hospital, visiting with Dr. Silkworth, he asked him about this. And he said, I've been trying to help other people and none seem to want what I have. And the doctor said to Bill, why don't you tell them what I told you? He said, every alcoholic I know wants to know two things. One, why can't I drink without getting drunk? And two, why can't I quit now that I want to quit? And he said, if you will explain to them the hopeless condition of the mind and of the body, then you'll get their interest. And then you can talk to them about spirituality. And we know it's not by accident that Bill visited with Dr. Bob in May of 1935. And for the first time, he tried that out. And he explained to Dr. Bob the exact nature of his illness. Dr. Bob bought into it immediately and began to practice the program of the Oxford groups to a depth he never had before. And after one more drunk, he recovered never to drink again. In June the 10th, 1935, he had that last drink in the parking lot of the hospital, that, can, that bottle of beer, no cans in those days. And that was the beginning of Alcoholics Anonymous. And of course, those two people, two people were considered to be the co-founders. Probably if Ebby had stayed sober, he would have been considered as a co-founder. But we know some years later, Ebby found it necessary to drink some more. In 1937, the New York AAs separated from the Oxford groups. In 1937, the meeting was held there in Akron that determined the writing of the Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous. And the group in Akron did not want to separate from the Oxford groups at that time. So they continued as members of the Oxford groups. Those in New York City were just known as drunks who were trying to recover. We also know that in 1938, John Rockefeller gave us the $5,000. And in 1939, 
And the people were very disappointed because they expected much more. And Mr. Rockefeller said, don't come back to me for money anymore. This is all I'm going to let you have. And he said, I really believe money would destroy this outfit. Thank God that Mr. Rockefeller had that idea. The $5,000 went primarily to Bill and Bob to help support them to a certain extent while trying to get this thing off the ground. And as John showed us in the beginning, it was eventually paid back by the fellowship. In 1938, since they had made this decision to write the big book, since they knew there was going to be a lot of money coming in, they decided there had to be some vehicle to handle and control and take care of that money. They knew that if they tried to do it within their groups, that it would destroy them surely. So they formed a thing in 1938 called the Alcoholic Foundation. And if my memory serves me correct, there was five people on that foundation. And the purpose of the foundation was to take over the legal function, to handle the monies, to do the things necessary business-wise. It was incorporated in the state of New York, and it was decided to keep all of that business out of the AA meetings themselves let the corporation handle it, the foundation. In 1938, Bill began to write the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. And somewhere throughout that year and the early part of 1939, they completed the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. The actual 12 steps were written either in December or the early part of 1939. In April of 1939, the book Alcoholics Anonymous was published. And the date it was published was the date that we were given our first legacy. And we know that 100 people had recovered by that time through this information contained in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. We also know that shortly thereafter, AA began to grow by leaps and bounds. We also know that many, many people began to recover from this hopeless condition of the mind and body called alcoholism. Now, we believe today that one of the reasons that they were so good at recovering from that little disease is because they had a program of action and that program of action was to take people who were absolute emotional basket cases who were spiritually, physically, and morally bankrupt who couldn't get along with anybody, period, much less themselves and to start producing some form of stability within their lives so that they would be able to stay sober and feel good enough to keep that sobriety, to give them some form of emotional stability within their lives so that it wouldn't be necessary to go back to drinking from time to time. Now, I'm not sure whether Bill really realized it at the time he wrote the steps. But we've been able to see this weekend, as we've gone through them, a certain pattern in the writing of the steps. Let's review that for just a moment. We see here the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Joe, would you give me some water, please? And as you've heard us talking for the last three or four days, we believe that step one tells us what our problem really is, powerless. And if we have a problem in order to recover from it, we'll have to have a solution. 
And if the problem is powerless, then the solution is power. Now, after we once see the solution, then it's going to be necessary to know how do you find that solution. And we've been able to see where Bill took the little practical program of action, the tenets of the Oxford groups, and expanded them into some steps that we refer to as action steps, with the purpose of the action steps being designed to let us find that solution. Now, each one of these steps has a certain idea or a certain action within the step itself. Let's very briefly review what that action would be. Joe, would you talk just for a moment about step three? Step three. <laughs> Damn good step, isn't good. it? Huh? <laughs> you see, we never know what we're going to do in this, and that's where we get our fun out of this, too. See, I'm supposed to have three, because they used to take it away from me. They give it back to me. I didn't know I had it. He's confused tonight. We've got him mixed up. Okay. Since all action is initiated with a decision, step three is the beginning of the recovery program. You know, all action is born in decision. Good, and it's good. in step three based on one and two because of what we see in one and two, we make a decision to turn our will and our life for care of God. If we are powerless and we want this power, then we have to turn over our will, which is our power. And this is the beginning of the action. Very little action involved in step three. But of course, we used the prayer and took a little bit of action in step three. John, what's the action in step four? In order to validate the decision process, we make a fact-finding and fact-facing, truthful, written list of ourselves. This is the first tangible evidence, really, of our of our recovery process, and really, in fact, validates the decision that we made. First action step. So the action involved there is the taking of the inventory. What's the action in step five, Joe? Once we gather this information, uh, in order to improve on this information, we talk to God, to ourselves, and another human being about it, trying to get a deeper, a better picture of the information that we have gathered in step four. So our action involved there, we're dealing primarily with admission to another human being, and from that feedback to give us more information. What's the exact action involved in six, John? Step six. <laughs> <laughs> have I ever had step six before? No. 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 Step six is a, to develop an attitude of being entirely ready to have God remove the defects of character. Developing an attitude of being entirely willing and ready. All right. The action here is a thing we call willingness. As we could see today, if we don't have it, we pray until we get it. What's the action involved in seven, Joe? Having become willing to let go of these things, we ask God to remove them in step seven. Okay, the action implied is the removal of those shortcomings, of course, through prayer. How about the action in eight, John? Step eight is the beginning of our relation to clean up the wreckage of the past, and we make a list of people we have harmed. What's the action in nine, Joe? In step nine, we make direct amends to such people and clear up our relationship with other people. Okay, one making the list, the other one making the actual amends. Now, there's also an action involved in 10, which we haven't really talked about yet. What would be the action in 10? To continue to do everything that you've done up until this time on a daily basis. <laughs> That's good. That's great. That really is great. <laughs> continue to take that inventory. And we're going to find tomorrow as we begin to look at it, 
step 10 would involve all of the actions taken from 4 through 9 on a daily basis through the continuation of this inventory. What's the action in 11, Joe? 11 is the final action. Through prayer and meditation, we receive God's will. In step 3, we made a decision to turn over our will. And then in steps 4 through 10, we cleared away the thing that blocked us. And now in step 11, we complete the process by receiving God's will. And this is the, the, the final step of action as far as our growth. So through the seeking of God's will in step 11, we receive God's will back in our lives. Now I think it's very easy to see that each one of those steps from 3 through 11 does entail an action of some kind. Now, the result of that action, of course, will be given to us in step 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we are guaranteed a certain result if we will take those action steps and make them a part of our life. We're guaranteed to have a spiritual awakening. And the spiritual awakening, of course, is the personality change sufficient to recover from that hopeless condition of the mind and body known as alcoholism. So I think it's quite easy to say that this rhythm here, one, the problem, two, the solution, three through eleven being the action resulting in a spiritual awakening will give us what we like to refer to as emotional sobriety. Now, there's all kinds of sobriety. There's a little bit of sobriety. There's short-term sobriety. There's dry sobriety. There's white-knuckle sobriety. And most of us have employed and tried those kinds of sobriety. And really, we don't get a hell of a lot out of it. But if we will use the 12-step program and if we will receive the spiritual awakening, then we will be emotionally sober. You know, if I don't use this program in my life, I may be dry, I may be sober, but under those conditions, I'm just about as drunk emotionally as I ever was drunk physically when I was drinking alcohol. And to be sober and not be able to enjoy it, to be sober and to be an emotional basket case, is really not very good as far as living is concerned. And to be sober and not have emotional sobriety usually leads us right back to drinking. So we can see that the steps are designed not just to get us sober and keep us sober. They are designed to give us that emotional sobriety so that we can stay sober and be happy about it at the same time. And they never fail for those that really try them. Today we know that within our fellowship we have approximately 2 million people sober on this first legacy Hopefully they will all eventually work it and be able to keep decent sobriety in their life. We have no idea how many millions have recovered and already died and gone on before us. From the first 40, from the first 100, this legacy has given us recovery throughout the entire world. Now, as these people begin to sober up, and as the fellowship began to grow, way back in the early 1940s, as the fellowship got bigger and bigger, the problems began to multiply. Because we begin to put certain rules on people coming into AA. Some groups had rules concerning membership. Some groups had rules concerning who's going to run the group and who isn't. Some groups had rules regarding who is the authority and who isn't. 
Some groups wanted to get into the alcoholism recovery field and did. Some groups wanted a lot of newspaper and at that time film coverage. Some groups wanted to promote AA. Some groups could see no reason for being self-supporting. And as the fellowship grew and these different ideas began to expand, AA began to tear itself apart from within. And after a period of time, Bill began to see the need for a set of principles that could be used at the group level to give to the group the same thing that the steps gave to the individual, emotional sobriety. You know, we can come together in a group and we can be just as drunk emotionally, collectively, as we can be drunk emotionally as an individual, or as we can actually be drunk physically, collectively, or as an individual. And I begin to see that if we didn't do something about some of these things, that sooner or later we would destroy ourselves through the fighting and the various things going on within the fellowship. Now, Bill began to think about and talk about these principles back in the early 1940s. He began to receive letters from different people and different groups all over the country. And those letters would be telling about a certain thing that had taken place in that group and what the terrible results were of that particular thing, whatever it might be. They'll begin to write letters and correspond with people and ask them, do you have any rules in your group? And if so, what are they? And one of the things that we seem to have the greatest difficulty with was this thing concerning the membership of Alcoholics Anonymous. Remember coming out of the Oxford groups, they wanted upstanding members of the community so that people would look at the Oxford groups and say, oh, those are really great people over there. Kind of filtered into AA. And the members were quite concerned about what the public in general would think about us if we didn't have the right kind of people in AA. They began to worry about what they would think if we had somebody in here who might be a criminal or an ex-convict. They begin to worry about what the public would think of us if we had women in our fellowship who were ex-prostitutes and things like that. And most of these groups begin to apply rules regarding membership. At one time, Bill canvassed the entire fellowship to get their membership rules. When he got them back and read them all, he said to his amazement and amusement, he found that he nor Dr. Bob either one could be members if all the rules were in force at the same time. <laughs> now, he began to develop these ideas and the normal fellowship or organization might have wanted to call them the rules of conduct. But Bill knew that you wasn't about to use the word rules with alcoholics. So he searched around for a better word to describe them. And he finally came up with the word traditions, which have no force behind them to enforce them, but which perhaps most people would begin to accept within the fellowship itself. And as soon as he began to write these things and ask people information and ask them about what they thought of them, he ran into the same stone wall that he ran into with the 12 steps. They said, what the hell do we need rules for? And who are you to tell us what we can do and what we can't do? And I don't care if you do have an office in New York City. You're not about to tell us what we're going to do in our group. And Bill had to do another selling job, just like he had to do with the 12 steps in the beginning. And he began to travel, and he traveled back in the 40s and during the Second World War, when traveling was very difficult to do. 
literally hundreds of thousands of miles, visiting AA groups throughout our entire country and throughout Canada to try to get them to accept these things called traditions. The usual thing was said when he came into one of those meetings was, Bill, tell us about your flash that you had in the towns, but lay off those damn traditions. We don't want to hear about them. (laughs) And it took him several years to begin to get enough people interested in them that he began to feel that he could get them approved. Finally, a decision was made to call a meeting in 1950, and that meeting was to be held in Cleveland, and it was to become the first international conference of Alcoholics Anonymous. And at that meeting were people from all over the United States, Canada, and all the other countries at that time that AA had started in and that had little general service offices of their own. And at this conference, he presented to the membership as a whole these things called traditions. The membership as a whole looked at them, voted on them, and accepted them as the second legacy of Alcoholics Anonymous, the steps being the first, Now then, the traditions becoming the second. With the idea that if we would follow these traditions, then we could keep emotional sobriety within our groups, the same as the steps would give it to us within our own personal lives. We believe that Bill followed identically the same pattern with these traditions that he followed with the steps. I don't know whether Bill realized this is what he was doing or not. But it's quite easy to see as we look at the 12 traditions that the first tradition identifies a problem. The problem is this. How do you keep unity within your group? How do you keep from fighting with each other? How do you keep the controversy out of the group? If we fight with each other, if we have controversy about many different things, then we really don't have time to work on our own sobriety, much less help other people keep their sobriety also. So the problem becomes, how do you keep the unity? Unity is vitally important. Because without the group, we're probably all going to fail. One of the great strengths of Alcoholics Anonymous is when we individuals come together and we're able to share our experiences and our knowledge and we're able to take our diverse backgrounds and meld them together in one great whole and keep ourselves sober and help other alcoholics to stay sober at the same time. Probably unity is the most cherished thing within Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I don't know of any other fellowship in the world that gives more open license and more open reign to their members in AA. You can do about anything you want to and be a member of AA. But there is one place that we draw the line. If, as an individual member of AA, you begin to create controversy within our group, and you continue to create the controversy long enough, we will sacrifice the individual for the good of the whole. And I've seen it happen over and over, where finally the group conscience takes over, and we ask that individual to please leave and stay the hell out of here until he can come back with a different attitude. There is one place we will sacrifice the individual, and that is to preserve the unity. That is the most important thing we have. Now, the solution to that problem of unity is to be found within the second tradition. And the second tradition tells us this. 
We recognize no authority in Alcoholics Anonymous except a loving God as he expresses himself in the group conscience. The only authority in AA is a loving God expressing himself through what we hope is the informed group conscience of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, since God is the only authority, then we really don't have anything to argue about as to who's in charge and who isn't. Only God is. Now, to be sure that we keep that solution and to be sure that God is the only authority, we next have a group of traditions that we like to refer to as non-action. The steps, they are referred to as action. But in these following traditions, I think we would see within each one of them, not action but non-action. Not so much what do we do as what do we not do in order to keep this cherished thing called unity and let God be the only authority. So let's look for non-action within each of these. Joe, how about number three? The third tradition, the first non-actions. The only require for membership is a desire to stop drinking. You know, there is a, this is one simple statement. The only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. So we have no other rules or guidelines about membership. And we have no other, if, if, if the only requirement is the desire to stop drinking, we should never have any argument in the group about membership. So there will be no argument about membership. In the early days, they had so many different things coming up about who can be a member of AA. And they had, they had rules about when you got drunk, you had to stay out for a year or six months. And as Charlie said, it couldn't, some groups couldn't be any convicts. Willie's not here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, they had one rule that, well, they be wouldn't careful, let be it. Be careful now. <laughs> <laughs> I get in trouble every time I talk about this. But they had one rule that they wouldn't have any fallen women in AA. Ain't that a heck of a thing? There was a whole lot of I don't know what they were, but I heard them talk about it. So they had all these different rules, and there was a lot of argument about rules. So we'll just get rid of all the arguments, and we, if we don't have any discussion about rules, we can have unity on that level because the only requirement is a desire to stop drinking. So we should have no arguments about memberships. One well, of the, that, was, that was one of the biggest problems at that time. One of the things we laugh about on this is Joe said that fallen women thing one night. <laughs> <laughs> Willie was sitting right by the side of him. And some of you know Willie, big, long Texas lady, fine lady. And Joe said Willie could not have been a man. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at him and said, Honey, <laughs> I believe you have it mixed up. <laughs> it always amazes me today. This rule regarding membership. <laughs> The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. That is so simple, yet today we sit around and argue about who can and who cannot be. You know, somebody says, I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. And somebody immediately says, you can't be a member of AA. Somebody says, I'm an alcoholic and a something else. And they say, you can't be a member of AA. You know, the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. Anybody, anywhere, anytime that's willing to state they have a desire to stop drinking is automatically a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> they can be anything they want to be as long as they have a desire to stop drinking. You know, this tradition is meant to be inclusive rather than exclusive. In the beginning, they tried to exclude people because of fear. 
But as time went by, they began to see those fears were ungrounded. So they began to say, well, hell, let's don't keep them out. Let's try to bring them in. And they made this tradition as inclusive as they can possibly be. You can be an alcoholic and uh, anything you want to be. If you have a desire to stop drinking, you are automatically a member of AA if you say you are a member of AA. And I'm glad that's true. I would hate to be on the group committee that votes on who can and who cannot be a member of AA. I would hate to be in the judgment business and try to determine which alcoholic can be and which one cannot. You don't have to be a pure alcoholic to be a member of AA as long as you have a desire to stop drinking. Number four also has a non-action within it, John. Yeah, thanks. I'm just thinking about them fallen women. I'm glad they let them in. <laughs> they make some of the best AA members you've ever seen in your life. Fourth tradition, uh, you got to say this about traditions. You know that uh, the traditions... Uh, just having a little flashback. <laughs> Not a blackout this time, a real flashback. <laughs> John said he didn't have Alzheimer's disease. He's got sometimes disease. <laughs> <laughs> the thing we haven't said yet that is that with these traditions, they were born out of experience. They weren't just set out and dreamed up as rules and regulations. These traditions, all of them, came from the experience that we had. And so that we finally set down these principles which said if we can agree on these things, we won't have anything to argue about, and if we don't argue, we will stay unified. And this particular tradition, it says that each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. And what that simply means that if some of you, probably in your home area and as you travel, you see that a lot of groups operate in a lot of different ways. Some of them are speaker meetings, some of them are step meetings, some of them are open meetings, some of them are closed meetings. And thank God we don't have to write to some central office and say, we want to start a group, what's open? We can determine ourselves what it is we want to do. And the only, the only flag about it is that we do not, uh, that we do not any, do anything that would harm other groups in the area or Alcoholics Anonymous as a whole. But we are, as groups, are free to choose our destiny and our direction. We are autonomous. And it implies that, that groups can make mistakes too. Just like we, uh, that, just like we have a four step inventory, sometimes we, groups need to take an inventory about what they're all about. The non action involved in that particular tradition is simply that no one group can tell any other group what to do. And people always ask the question, well, how do you know if you're going to hurt other groups or AA as a whole? And my usual answer is, if you're breaking traditions, then you may be harming not only your group, but other groups, and also AA as a whole. And as long as what you're doing is not breaking an AA tradition, you're free to do anything that you want to do. And even if you did do one breaking an AA tradition, nobody has any authority to discipline the group anyhow. You know, the group really is... <coughs> The authority as a loving God expressing himself through that group conscience. Joe number five has a non-action in it. What is that? Number five. Each group has one primary purpose to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Now this uh, non-action, it, it spells out the purpose of the group. Uh, and this is a singular purpose. Um, and uh, one primary purpose. That's the one purpose of the group, to carry out messages to other alcoholics. And if the group about, uh, will follow that tradition, there will be no, no argument in the groups about what they're going to do. Uh, you know, if somebody brings in the group an idea to help the Girl Scouts, <laughs> you know, then somebody over here said, no, I want to help the Boy Scouts. And then the other one would say, well, we need to be doing this. And the other ones say, well, then they, oh, I'd rather do this. And so there's an argument about what the group, well, we don't do any of those things. But carry our message to, so we are single, we have a single purpose. And this is a binding factor. This is the single purpose of the AA group. So there should be no other arguments about doing other things. So therefore, there will be unity in the group 
on the on the purpose of, on the purpose level. Our non-action involved in here is we simply don't do anything except <laughs> one thing. The group carries its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Number six, what's the non-action there, John? An AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise unless problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Towards outside agencies dealing with alcoholism, the AA policy is cooperation but not affiliation. AA members employed by outside agencies wear two hats, but Tradition 6 cautions any such members against wearing both at once. On the job, they may be alcoholism counselors. They are not AA counselors. At meetings, they're just AAs, not alcoholism experts. <coughs> here, here. And the non-action involved here is simply we never endorse finance or live the AA name to any related facility, period. And if we don't do that, we have nothing to fight about. Unity has to prevail because of that. How about the non-action in number seven, Joe? Every AA group ought to be fully self-supported and declaring outside contribution. And I think that this is, you know, keeps that. This is truly one that can cause controversy. See, uh, if we, we, we are self-supported, we support ourselves as we pass the hat. Everything in AA is self-supported. Because if we take someone else's money and they support us, then they're going to tell us what we're going to have to do. And I think, you know, that's the one thing that I always love about Alcoholics Anonymous. And I feel very strongly about supporting my group and supporting everything in Alcoholics Anonymous because as Charlie as we was talked about here this weekend, you know, that we did get some money from Rockefeller, but we paid him back. In fact, we have paid, we don't owe it, we have paid all those people back, we don't owe them any money. You know, and Alcoholics Anonymous is, those of us who don't realize what we're really a part of, I'm really proud to be a, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous because of that. You know, you look around the world today and around our country and you turn on your TV and you pick up your newspapers and you think about all the great programs around the world and how much money they raise from the general public. You know, they, they always ask them for money. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous has, has performed a service for millions of people and has never asked the general public for one penny. That's what makes me proud to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I wonder, people think a lot of Alcoholics Anonymous, everybody all over the world uh, public officials and everybody else, they think a great deal of alcoholics now. I wonder if we if we really got on the TVs and things, I wonder how much money we could we raise. <laughs> we could raise billions of dollars. And it would destroy us. But I think I'm real proud that we support ourselves. And that's what, you know, when that basket is passed, that's what I want to be a part of. Because I'm really proud that we support ourselves. I think that's one of the reasons we need to be very careful when we're dealing with our so-called AA clubhouses, yeah. with our treatment centers, yeah. with people who work in and out of those. We all have the responsibility that regardless of what that facility is, we never use the AA name in order to try to raise funds for those facilities. And once in a while they do that. And when they do so, it looks to the general public as here's a bunch of drunks that's got their hands sticking out again. We run into a very interesting story over in England. There was a member of AA who was quite wealthy who died a couple years ago in England. And he left within his will several, several thousand pounds to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, of course, their general service office, just like ours, in complying with their tradition, refused to accept the money. We simply cannot do that. Within a relatively short period of time, a solicitor for the family filed a lawsuit against AA to force them to take the money. Now, in England, there is a law that if you are a private 
non-profit corporation. And if you accept funds from any source, you must accept them from all sources. And you don't have the right to turn it down. So the upshot of that was that AA, through some very, very friendly people, went through Parliament and had a special law passed to dispense AA from that particular law. <laughs> it's going to happen here in the United States just as sure as anything. It hasn't happened yet. But we've got two or three that are on the verge today of filing the lawsuit. And sooner or later, it'll probably, we'll probably have to do the same thing. There, they wanted to keep that tradition so badly that they actually went through Parliament and got a special dispensation from that law so they could remain self-supporting. Number eight. What would be the dawn action in eight, John? Number eight. Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. That means that we don't get paid for doing 12-step work, and we have certain centers like intergroup offices, central offices, general service office, in which we have to hire employees to see that 12-step work can be done, secretaries, and staff members, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so we, we do hire certain workers, mail people in the mailroom, and we pay them accordingly. But for our service, for our work, we never get paid for 12-step work. And if we could agree on that, we won't have anything to argue about. Hmm. Besides, who's going to determine how much Anthony's going to charge and how much I'm going to charge? We'd be fighting about it. <laughs> who's going to determine who gets paid and who doesn't? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. How about number nine, Joe, non-action? The next non-action, AA as such or never be organized. And we can hear about the non. We never. See what I mean? Uh, I love this and I uh, wonder why we even have it. Uh, I think it's totally impossible to organize it anyway. <laughs> you ain't going to organize this outfit very much. But we may create a service boards committee directly responsible for, the, uh, for those they serve. Uh, as we say, we are not an organization. We're not organized. Uh, I'll never be organized. Well, we have to have committees and, and uh, groups to perform our, our functions. Well, you know, we have an organization. That means you're going to have to have somebody at the head of it. And that is not an organization. It's a fellowship. In order to maintain an organization, you have to have certain rules. In order to have rules, you have to have a certain penalty. And uh, so we are not an organization as such. We're a fellowship. But under the function, though, we have to have serve, we have to have committees and groups of us to carry out the, the, the functions uh, of the fellowship. These people we elect to do these jobs for us are referred to as trusted servants. They have no authority, period, as far as being able to discipline or telling anybody in the fellowship what they need to do. They simply serve in that particular capacity. Number 10, John, non-action. Charlie Joe's complaining that he's got more than I do. Well, good for him. I'm glad he does. <laughs> Just worked out that way. We'll fix him up on concept. Okay, good. <laughs> the tenth tradition, Alcoholics Anonymous has no no opinion. No, there's that no, none, and all that. Opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. Think about how smooth it would be in here if we could all agree with that. No outside issues. And I think about what is the primary purpose. Tradition 5 tells us what our conversation is all about. Nothing but that. So if we can agree that we don't have any opinions on outside issues and we don't bring outside issues into our meetings, then we won't have anything to argue about. But I guarantee you one thing, as soon as we do, we do. That's it. I mean, that's... <laughs> if we start talking about politics... Yeah, religion. Politics. If we start talking about religion... If we start talking about other controversial issues with NIA, then surely we're going to have a hell of a fight within a hurry. Because I don't know of anybody that loves that stuff any more than we do. And it would literally destroy us within a very short period of time. Okay, number 11. What's the non-action there, Joe? Our public relation policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need to always maintain personnel to the level of press, radio, and films. 
I think this is quite obvious, you know, because we get in all kind of arguments about who's going to represent the group on TV. And, <laughs> and one would want them to be doing it. It would be a lot of confusion. So this is a non-action. If we get it, we don't get into these things. There won't be any controversy in the group. He'd always maintain person him to the level of press, radio, and films. I think this is quite obvious, you know, because we get in all kind of arguments about who's going to represent the group on TV. And, <laughs> and one would want them to be doing it. It would be a lot of confusion. So this is a non-action. If we get it, we don't get into these things. There won't be any controversy in the group. And I think, you know, we say, you know, well, it's attraction rather than, I think that has really been the success of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's very difficult because, you know, most everything in the world has to be promoted. And that's another thing that's really different about Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not promoted. Everything that we see is promoted. Uh, and that's what makes us different. And maybe that's what makes us attractive. That we're not promoted. We do not promote ourselves. And I think that's a, one, of, one of the greatest attractions in, in our society today, the lack of promotion. Of course, one of the purposes of this particular tradition is to protect AA itself. If we have a well-known figure, public figure, who becomes a member of AA, and if that figure, within a relatively short period of time, begins to appear in front of the press, radio, television, etc., promoting AA and promoting himself as a member of AA, and then that person gets drunk. Then it looks very bad as far as AA concerns. And I think every time that happens, there's probably two or three people out there just on the verge of joining AA, and they see that guy get drunk or that woman get drunk, and they say, see, I told you the damn thing wouldn't work anyhow. And we end up not only hurting the image of AA, but we hurt future members of AA. Another reason for that particular tradition is to protect we individuals. Nobody loves that kind of stuff more than we do. Nobody loves that recognition more than we do. And we start seeing our name and our picture appearing on radio, television, in the film, etc., then automatically we become better than the other members of AA. And automatically we become something special in AA. And usually our ego gets out of hand and we end up drunker than hell. So this tradition is designed to protect the individual members also. I had one in my group who was so worried that people would find out he was in AA. That's just about all he could talk about. If nobody tell anybody I'm a member of AA, blah, then finally I said, don't worry. We don't want people to know you're in AA either. <laughs> the 11th tradition plainly states the level at which we are to keep our anonymity, at the level of the press, radio, and film. If I wish to reveal my full name to you within this fellowship, that is perfectly all right. That is my business. I cannot reveal my name and my AA membership at the level of press, radio, and film without breaking this tradition. But I can sure as hell break my own anonymity within AA if I wish to. If I wish to go to my doctor who knows me and tell him I'm a member of AA, I certainly have the right to do that. In fact, it is encouraged that I do so. So the doctor might be able to take another patient and have me 12-step and let them become members of AA. If I wish to talk to my lawyer and tell him I'm a member of AA, that's fine. There is no problem with this unless we do it at the level of press, radio, and film. This tradition is meant to guide us in our public relations policy. It is certainly not meant to hide us from each other within AA. Now, if you don't want to use your last name within AA, that's fine also. 
that's your business entirely. Just like if I want to use mine, that's my business entirely, as long as it's not done at the level of press, radio, and film. Now, we can see that these traditions, 3 through 11, are all non-action things, things we do not do, things we should not do, things we ought not do. They are different than the steps. The steps are action. These are non-action. And I believe today that if we will practice these, three, these traditions 3 through 11, then we will get certain results from that. And the result that we will get is tradition 12, which is spiritual anonymity. And as we look at tradition 12, it tells us that it reminds us to always place principles before personalities. Spiritual anonymity is entirely different than personal anonymity. You know, keeping my name away from the press, radio, film, that's one thing. But spiritual anonymity is where we all practice true humility. We all give up our own needs, wants, and desires for the good of the group as a whole. You know, all these traditions, 3 through 11, they go against our nature. And the things that, that, that's the reason they're there, because our nature is to do the things that would screw us up. And if you and I are able <coughs> to repress our needs, wants, and desires through those traditions of 3 through 11, then we are practicing what's called spiritual anonymity, where everybody is the same, everybody is level, we have no bosses, we have no authorities, we are all entirely equal with NAA, and whether you have one day sobriety or 30 years, doesn't make a bit of difference. The result of those traditions will be spiritual anonymity. Now, at the same time that Bill presented these to the fellowship, he also presented another thing dealing with this thing we call the service structure. About the time Bill really got these things set up, in about 47 or 48, and about the time he really got the fellowship to the point where they were about to agree to them, Bill found out that Dr. Bob was suffering with another terminal illness other than alcoholism. And it became apparent that Dr. Bob wouldn't live very much longer. And Bill was faced with one hell of a dilemma. Because back in the beginning, when this little alcoholic foundation was formed, Bill and Bob were the spokesmen between that foundation and the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. The people within our fellowship gave Bill and Bob that authority to represent them with this alcohol foundation. The people said, we don't want to get involved in that business. You two guys do all of our representation and keep us out of it. Now then... One of the two people that were our representatives is suddenly coming up with another terminal illness. And they'll begin to see and worry and think about the fact that someday he would die also. And the question in his mind became, when Bob and I are gone, who will represent the fellowship in its dealings with the Alcohol Foundation? And there had to be some way designed, some means, to let the fellowship take over from Bill and Bob and be their own representatives in this business deals as far as the Alcohol Foundation was concerned. Bill knew that if he didn't get it done before Bob died, that the rest of the membership would say, well, he's just waited till Bob dies, and now he's going to take it over for sure. Remember, Bill's a real alcoholic. He knows how people like us think. And he began to work on a design with the help of a fellow named Bernard Smith, who was a member of that alcohol foundation, 
on a little plan, whereas the fellowship could become responsible for its own business affairs. In 1950 at Cleveland, not only did he present the traditions as the second legacy, he also presented this thing called the service structure or the charter for Alcoholics Anonymous. And this charter had 12 little principles in it. We're not about to go through them. But the charter set up a means where each group could, through an elected representative, be able, through another electoral process, select a member for a given area to be their representative when it comes to the business dealings. He told the people in 1950, he said, we have had no experience with this kind of thing at all. And he said, frankly, I'm not even sure it will work. He said, as far as the steps are concerned, they were hammered out on experience. These are the steps we took. As far as the traditions are concerned, they were hammered out on experience of what did not work. He said, this may or may not work. He said, I think it will. And he said, what I ask you for is to give us a five-year experimental plan. And he said, we'll come back together in five years. If it has worked, we can keep it as is. If we need to change it, we can. Or if we don't want it, we can throw it out. And in 1950, they gave us gave him and the others the authority to put this plan into operation on a five-year experimental basis. Now, all it really consists of, and we're not about to go deeply into any service structure or anything else, but we must understand that there is a third legacy, and the purpose of it is to allow you, not me, but you to have a voice in Alcoholics Anonymous other than just at the group level. Each group within AA elects, hopefully, what we call a general service representative. There will be so many groups within a designated area that we call a district. These general service representatives come together at a district meeting. There they elect certain officers. They elect what we call a district committee, used to be man, I think it's member now, district committee member, and an alternate, and a secretary, and a treasurer, and whatever is needed to take care of our business affairs at that district level. Also, the United States and Canada are divided up into what we call delegate areas. There happens to be 91 of them. Originally, each state was a delegate area, and each province in Canada was a delegate area. But because of geographical locations, difficulty in getting around, because some areas had large AA populations and some had small, some of those delegate areas were split up into more than one. New York has four, does it not? California, I think, has five, does it not? Texas has four. Missouri has two. Missouri's was not because of extreme population, but simply because all of the business in Missouri takes place either in St. Louis or Kansas City and they split it into two areas. Arkansas has one. Most states do. There is a total of 91 delegate areas. Within the delegate area, there may be 10, 12, 15 of these districts. The districts come together at a meeting we call the Area Assembly. And there, your district committee members your GSRs from your individual groups get together and elect what we call area officers. 
We have the area chairperson. We have the alternate area chairperson. We have the area secretary, the area treasurer, and whatever else is needed at that particular area. Now, in the beginning, the area was designed to do one thing and one thing only. At that area assembly meeting, they elected one person to represent that entire area at a business meeting in New York City. And that person was called the delegate. The delegate from Area 4, the delegate from Area 31, the delegate from Area 62. These delegates meet together in April of each year in New York City, and they are the effective voice, spokesman, conscience, and authority for you and I. They are our authority. We give that to them as we elect those people and put them in that position, and that's the way we express our authority and our responsibility in AA. Now, AA is made up, though, of more than just AA groups. Remember, we have a foundation. The foundation has to be incorporated because it deals with business. It hires employees. It pays insurance. It withholds income tax. And it has to be incorporated. So we have a corporation that is incorporated within the state of New York. And it is today called the Alcoholic Foundation or the Board of Trustees. Originally, there was five. Originally, the majority of them were non-alcoholics. Because it was felt in the beginning that we alcoholics would never get it together good enough to run our own business, and we needed those non-alcoholics to take care of it. Bill saw the fallacy of that in later years. Bill began to change the makeup of the board by fighting with people, and he finally did get it to a majority of alcoholics. Today, the board of trustees has 21 members. Fourteen of them are alcoholic. They have been elected from these delicate areas, from things that they refer to as regions that we really don't need to go into. But there's a total of 14 of them. Seven of them are non-alcoholics. The alcoholics are there primarily because of their expertise in certain areas. We may have an economist on there. We may have one who's an attorney. We may have one who's a teacher. We may have a doctor on there. There can be several different things and reasons for having them on. Now, those 21 trustees own two companies, and very briefly. One company is called Alcoholics Anonymous World Services. It has an office in New York City. We call it the General Service Office. We're all familiar with that term. At the General Service Office, we have staff members there who take care of mine and your business on a daily basis. Those staff members are all alcoholic. Now, they will have other employees there, secretaries, mail clerks, and et cetera, and et cetera, but the staff members are all alcoholic. Also, the Board of Trustees owns another corporation called the Grapevine. We all know what the Grapevine is. And there we have X number of staff members and X number of employees. Those two corporations, AWS, and by the way, AWS also owns the publishing company. We own our own publishing company. Those two corporations are also incorporated in the state of New York. Therefore, they have their own board of directors. But the 21 trustees own and oversee the operation of those two corporations. So we really have the fellowship as one entity. We have the trustees as one entity. And we have the two corporations with their employees as another entity. At the General Service Conference in New York City in April, you will find the 91 delegates 
you will find the 21 trustees, and you will find, I believe, 24 members, directors, and staff from the two corporations. If my memory serves me right, we have a total of 135 yep. at the General Service Conference. Now, the purpose of the General Service Conference is for these two corporations and for the Board of Trustees to report to the delegates on everything that's been going on with the last year, to give the financial reports, to open up all the files, and to make everything available to the 91 delegates. The purpose of the General Service Conference is for the 91 delegates to work with the trustees and the directors of the two corporations to determine what our business is going to be for next year. They set the budget, and then through committee functions, they determine policy, recommend changes, and etc. A new piece of literature, such as the new Reflections book, had to go through the General Service Conference. Anything that we do which constitutes a change will go through the General Service Conference for final approval. Now, it takes at the General Service Conference a minimum of a two-thirds majority voting on something to make an approval recommendation and to make it binding. If my memory serves me right, 90 is two-thirds of 135. The delegates always have a two-thirds majority voting representation. So our elected delegates always have the majority vote for anything necessary at the General Service Conference. They never vote in a block, though because they never have to. Remember, 14 of the trustees are alcoholic also. They're not about to get together on anything either. <laughs> All the staff members are alcoholics. They're not about to get together on anything either. But if we ever had to, we have two-thirds majority at the General Service Conference. That's the little thing that Bill set up for us. In 1955, they met again. The second international conference was held in St. Louis. And in 1955, Bill presented this plan to them as a permanent thing. The fellowship voted on it and accepted it as the third legacy of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when that happened, Bill said, the fellowship is now safe even from me. <laughs> because he effectively transferred all authority from himself to the membership as a whole. Now, each year as it went by at the General Service Conference, Bill began to notice a lot of conflict going on. They couldn't really decide who is in charge of this damn thing. The delegates have two-thirds vote, but the trustees legally own AAWS the publishing company, general service office, and the great bank. So they begin to fight a little bit about who really does have this authority, and blah, 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 blah. And Bill begin to see this controversy develop and begin to actually reduce the effectiveness of the general service conference. The last thing he did for us was to develop what is called the 12 concepts. Now, people like to say they are the third legacy. No, they are not. The third legacy is the charter, which sets up the General Service Conference. The 12 concepts were developed at a later date in the 60s, and the purpose of the concepts was to do the same thing for the General Service Conference that the traditions do for the group, that the steps do for the individual to give us emotional sobriety at the national, international level. You know, these 91 delegates 
these 21 trustees, these 24 board and staff members can become as emotionally drunk at the General Service Conference <laughs> as they ever were physically drunk. I know I've seen it happen. They can go absolutely crazy up there from time, and they do. So these concepts, they are referred to as interaction. The action that takes place between the trustees, the delegates, staff members, and directors at the General Service Conference. Let us have five minutes to look at them. We're not going to try to go into them in any depth, but each one of them has a certain little idea. Concept one is the problem. How do the groups express their authority and responsibility for AA as a whole? That's the problem. Concept two is the solution. Concept two says that the General Service Conference will effectively become the conscience and the voice of AA as a whole, representing the entire fellowship. Concept 3 through 11 deals with interaction. Joe, do you want three or do you want four? I do three. Okay, you do three. Joe likes three. As a traditional means of creating and maintaining clear and defined working relationship between the groups, the conference... The AA General Service Board and its, its uh, several service corporations, staffs, committees, and executives, and thus ensuring their effective leadership, it is here suggested that we endow much of these elements of world service with the tr traditional right of decision. You know, this is a kind of a legal thing, boy, to get you. But you know what is, I'm simply saying is we, each, each group has a right of decision. And we give everybody, even a general, you know, a GSR, when he goes to a group, we don't tell him how he should vote. You know, we let him, we give him the right of making that decision because he might get at that meeting and there might be some other information presented to him which would change and reflect on that decision. So we give everybody, each individual, the right of decision. I think it's what it really is saying is when your delegate goes to the General Service Conference, he does not go instructed on how to vote. Yeah. He has the right of decision and votes according to his own conscience based upon information presented there. John, number four. Concept four deals with the right of participation, uh, allowing that each classification or group of world servants shall be allowed a voting representation in reasonable proportion to the responsibility that each must discharge. It simply says that nobody in the conference or in our, uh, of the 135 is any better or any worse than anybody else. They all have, all have one vote. Right. One vote. Okay, right of appeal and petition, Joe. Okay, concept five. Throughout our world service structure, a traditional right of appeal ought to prevail. This is assuring us that, that the minority opinion will be heard and that the pe petition uh, for the redress of personal grievance will be carefully considered. So this deals with the minority opinions. You know, even after we vote, we want to make sure that we we hear everybody in the particular AA. You know, it's one thing everything goes on by two thirds votes, and this kind of guarantees us that we get the right opinion. Then after that, we have the the ones who uh, the minority group still has a right and appeal to come back again and ask to be heard after they are voted down. And a lot of times, you know, even they find even this conference that in some cases after they have voted it down by two thirds, the minority people come back up, you know, a quote they state their position again. The conference can look at it again and sometimes they change their opinion. So this makes sure that we get down to the, to the best information. And I, and by listening more at the, to a minority appeal. Number six. Concept six, as says, deals primarily with the primary administration, administrative responsibilities of everybody connected with our general service conference and board, and it just lays out how uh, how we are to run our service board. It recognizes that the general service board is the primary administrative authority and responsibility for AA. There's no way that you and I can do it on a daily basis. That job is the job of the Board of Trustees. Number seven, legal rights of trustees, Joe. 
on legal rights of the trustees. The conference recognizes the charter and the bylaws of the General Service Board are legal instruments and that the trustees are thereby fully employed to manage and conduct the World Service Affairs of Alcoholics Anonymous. In other words, we, we know that these people actually, although we have this, this conference and we'll go there and, and, and make these decisions, actually this is the trustees do run this business. They never take any actions, though, that the conference don't tell them to. But we recognize them as the managers of the legal entity of the business. Number eight, Sean. Number eight uh, deals with uh, the direct managers of the overall finance and policy. It talks about the delegated authority so as to take care of our business, both financial and power, to make sure that it doesn't get too heavily concentrated in any one area. Number nine, Joe. Good service leaders, together with the sound and appropriate methods of choosing them, are at all levels indispensable for our future functioning and safety. And this talks about uh, uh, good leadership. You know, are we always anywhere in Alcoholics Anonymous we would like, it is even at the group level, all the way to the top, we want to select the best person we can to represent us because we're no better than the people that represent us. I think one of the greatest mistakes we talk about it all the time is electing somebody at GSR because he's not at the meeting. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm finding to getting the sickie out of the group saying we'll make him a GSR and he'll get well at the service level. No, he'll make somebody else sick. You know, send the best one we got. Don't do that. Number 10, John. Concept 10 <laughs> deals with the uh, authority and responsibilities, and they're well-defined. And it says to be sure that there is an abundance of final and ultimate authority to correct or to reorganize. But let us be equally sure that all of our trusted servants have a clearly defined and adequate authority to do their daily work and to discharge their clear responsibility. Well-defined. If you're going to give them the responsibility, give them the authority. If they screw up, you can always get rid of them. The worst thing you can do is hire somebody to do a job, make them responsible, but then look over their shoulder every day and nitpick at them. This says, let's don't do that. That destroys the whole thing. Number 11, Joe. Uh, the trustees hold final responsibility for AA World Service Administration. They should always have a system of the best possible standing committees, <laughs> proper service director, executive staff, and consultants. Consultants. This this is talks about you know that we give the uh, the trustees, the people who run our business, the authority to have the best property assistance they can can have uh, from in the field to help them do the job that they have to do. Now we can see that with all those concepts, with the interaction between the trustees, staff, directors, and delegates, that if we will follow these things then the conference is probably going to run pretty smooth. In fact, the results of that interaction will be what we call the warranties of the conference. A warranty is the same as a guarantee. Number 12 says, In all its proceedings, the General Service Conference shall observe the spirit of the AA tradition taking great care that the conference never becomes the seat of perilous wealth or power, that sufficient operating funds plus an ample reserve be its prudent financial principle, that none of the conference members shall ever be placed in a position of unqualified authority over any of the others, that all important decisions be reached by discussion, vote, and whenever possible by substantial unanimity, that no conference action ever be personally punitive or an incitement to public controversy, that though the conference may act for the service of Alcoholics Anonymous, it shall never perform any acts of government, and that like the Society of Alcoholics Anonymous which it serves, the conference itself will always remain democratic in thought and action. If these are followed, the warranties will be enforced. If these are not followed, the warranties, Ed, will no longer be a guarantee for us. The warranties are the results of this interaction. 
We have one more little bitty chart, and then we'll turn you loose. We believe that Bill followed the same general pattern or rhythm or layout in all three of these legacies. And again, we don't know whether he recognized that's what he was doing or not. But certainly, in the steps, we see the problem, the solution, and the action which results in a spiritual awakening which gives emotional sobriety to the individual. Surely we see within the traditions the problem, the solution, the non-action which gives us the spiritual anonymity needed and gives us emotional sobriety at the group level. Surely we see within these concepts the problem, the solution, and the interaction which results in the warranties for the General Service Conference, which gives us emotional sobriety at that level. Emotional sobriety is the key to the individual, to the group, and to the General Service Conference. Thank you all for being here tonight. We hope to see you tomorrow. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.